Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick King. I am the Sustainable Households Manager at Urban Green Lab, and you are here for another episode of Sustainable Nashville Live. Uh, the purpose of this series is to open a dialogue between the public and organizations that are contributing to the great work in and around sustainability here in Nashville. And today, I am joined by Ginger Rose Cruick, uh, D Executive Director of Grow Enrichment. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to remind you all that Urban Green Lab is a nonprofit, and if you feel so inclined to support the work that we do, feel free to make a donation on our website. It's www.urbangreenlab.org. Uh, you can also text Team UGL to number 44321, and they'll send a link to your phone. Uh, with that, let's get started. Ginger Rose, how are you doing today? With the caveat of I know things are crazy, but if you can compartmentalize the craziness, how are you doing today? Mm. <laughs> I think I would have to just put all the crazy in a box on one of the shelves behind me and mm -hmm. just not think about it for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, but generally speaking, doing pretty well. Um, kind of in my element, we're babysitting and healing, bringing back to life about three, 400 trees in our backyard that were donated uh, for us to uh, get planted in Nashville. Um, okay. So it's taken, it's fallen to me to be the caregiver to kind of like heal them and get them ready for fall planting. And that has helped to ground me a lot in the past week. Like mm -hmm. having the thing that I love to focus on since we're kind of far away, like grows kind of, kind of in, in sort of a quiet season right now yeah. due to the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, at least you have those trees to kind of keep you centered and you yeah. know, in the path. Yeah, I definitely love, love working with plants. I miss working with the community a mm -hmm. lot. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure everyone else in the nonprofit sector, especially those of us who work in community development, uh, all of us are feeling it. All my teacher yeah. friends have felt it all summer. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a whole bunch. For those right? of us who live yeah. and breathe public education. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real challenge. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my people that I live with are pr pretty much probably very tired of me constantly trying to teach them about environmental science. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well, what's their problem? Environmental science is the good stuff that everyone should know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so could you start by telling us um, about Grow Enrichment, I'm sorry, Grow Enrichment, and um, what led you to the organization? So Grow Enrichment is a, it's really at the heart, it's a community development nonprofit. Uh, we have a project site in Nashville at Two Rivers Park. We partnered with Parks Department many years ago. I think this is our fourth year mm -hmm. at the park site. And uh, in that, we agreed to take over stewardship of about 14 acres worth of Two Rivers Park at the far northern end that was sort of underdeveloped and in need of caring stewards. And the permissions that come with that land use include uh, us being able to leverage the site to create the first free access food forest for the city mm -hmm. and also offer public education around environmental science since this sustainability and all the things mm -hmm. while also working on community development and engaging the community through volunteerism. Okay. Um, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of GROW and mm -hmm. it was really born out of just seeing the need. I was a resident of Donaldson for almost a decade um, mm -hmm. and just kind of got to really know that community and was seeing that uh, there's just so much land. There's so much public land available and you know, really thinking about how we use public land and the mission of Parks Department really spoke deeply to my heart. Uh, the mission of Parks Department in Nashville is to, um, uh, to I think it's to hold public land in trust for the public benefit. I think that you might have to double check me on the direct quote. Yeah. But essentially, you know, that led me to question, well, the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to make sense that like, what exactly does it mean for the public benefit? Which part of the public, which seg segment are we, are we servicing all segments and, and parks like all the rest of us are limited in their funds and their resources and all the things they can do. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking about, you know, like, hey, maybe instead of looking so big, 
we shrink it down and we look at individual parks in the community that is around each individual park and we assess what are the actual needs of those residents right there and mm -hmm. how can we leverage individual parks to better serve the people that live with them. Yeah. And for yeah. Donaldson, uh, obviously our project site is sitting right next to Two Rivers Middle School. And it came to my attention very early on that the PTO organization there had uh, made the decision to use all their funding to create a food and clothing bank inside of the school mm -hmm. to support their students. A lot of their student, students come from the Napier community mm -hmm. and um, they deal with a lot of food insecurity, housing insecurity, like most inner city. This is typical. This yeah. is what we, what we work with all the time. Um, but in that, I was thinking about, you know, well, we have all these acres of land that we're just growing grass on. <laughs> yeah. And so like, what, what could we do to get more food into that food bank? And specifically, what about protein? So I have an associate's degree in education. Mm -hmm. And in early childhood development, they talk about how critical nutrition is for students. Like the student who arrives rested and well-fed is, is so much more ready to learn than a student who doesn't have those, those things in their toolbox. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, thinking about how to get shelf stable proteins into the hands of those students really is what was the driving force behind the orchard mm -hmm. that we installed right next to the school building. Yeah. Um, which is intended to be a chestnut orchard. There are 14 mm -hmm. chestnut trees in that orchard, uh, along with almost 200 other kinds of trees. Yeah. Um, but eventually it will be just a chestnut orchard. And okay. each of those trees at maturity will produce 2,000 pounds of chestnuts a year. Okay. Um, which is a whole lot of protein. Yeah. It's a lot of protein. And we chose the chestnuts specifically because we're looking at this very specific di demographic of students who mm -hmm. are low income, who may be in the foster system, who maybe don't have access to, you know, some tree nuts require tools to open them. The mm -hmm. chestnuts do not. They have a soft shell and you can open them by hand. They're sweeter than most nuts. So for students who kind of aren't used to eating whole mm -hmm. foods, that's an easier transition. Um, so there's a lot of thought and intention that went behind that yeah. too. But yeah. really, I mean, GROW is about looking at the community and addressing the needs. That was kind of a long way to explain that. No, that was the perfect way to explain that. Um, <laughs> yeah, just kind of holistically looking at the communities that surround where, you know, your organization is and yeah. finding the best way to serve them. That's yeah. beautiful. I love that. I think that's a real root of sustainability in the bigger conversation of sustainability because you know, yeah, we could have a tunnel vision focus on just those 14 acres and making that land sustainable, which we do, like mm -hmm. we are doing the work to make that land more sustainable. But really the, the bigger picture of that is, well, how do we make the community sustainable? How do we make those, each of those students and their families sustainable? How do we make the school system sustainable? Mm -hmm. You know, what role can our organization play in, really creating authentic sustainability of people and place. Yeah. Those things go hand in hand. You have to care for both. This actually dovetails very well with my next question. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in sustainability? Well, um, so I am a native of North Texas. Okay. Um, I grew up in McKinney, Texas, uh, K through 12 there in North mm -hmm. Texas. And, uh, actually co-founded Grow with a friend of mine, Monica. Mm -hmm. We both grew up in McKinney, Texas. Okay. Um, but in our story is kind of unique and interesting. Uh, both of us are the same demographic that we're trying to serve. Uh, both mm -hmm. children of single parents, single mothers, um, low income. Um, but we grew up on different sides of the railroad track, so to mm -hmm. speak. <laughs> Even though we were both low income, there's a very different reality. Uh, for, for someone who happens to have my skin tone versus mm -hmm. someone who has other skin tones. Mm -hmm. And uh, we both were in the same high school overlapping. My senior year was her freshman year, but our school had 4,000 students in it. So yeah. never knew each other until after high school. And then when we got to talking about growing up in McKinney, Texas, I realized, oh my gosh, like we had two totally different experiences of everything, of the elementary school, the high school, the town, everything. 
And the two of us kind of came together with this shared, shared passion of, you know, how do we, how do we start to address some of these things, you know, Mm -hmm. growing more food, making food available. As a child, I remember because food was scarce in our home as a child. uh, There's a day I talk about this a little bit sometimes. uh, I remember my mom taking me to the local park. Parks have always been a sanctuary for me my Mm -hmm. entire life. Um, Always. And I remember asking my mom why there were not apple trees in the park because mm-hmm. apples are expensive in terms of fruit. When you're very poor, apples are not something you get all the time. And I really like apples. And I remember asking her, mom, there's all this land here. Why? And there's trees. They're planting trees. Why are they not planting apple trees or any kind of tree that makes food? And her answer was, well, I don't really know. I don't have a good answer for that. And that just stuck with me my whole life. As I continued to grow, and um, I ended up going through Master Gardener certification in Davidson County and learning okay. about all of that. I built, um, at the time, the third largest school garden in the city at Stanford Montori. Um, so I was very involved with learning. And um, then from there, you know, kind of realized the potential of that educational garden to do more, to inspire mm-hmm. people to do what we were doing in that garden in our own yards, and feeling frustrated with the limitations that were on that garden because it was on school property. Mm-hmm. Um, so then started looking at how can we bridge, how can we bridge the gap and move it to somewhere that's more expansive, that's more open, that the public has more access to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of, kind of how it came. Um, and then Monica actually was the one that brought permaculture to my consciousness. Mm-hmm. And at the time I was totally overwhelmed. You know, like people who know growth from the beginning know that like, when she first started talking to me about permaculture, I was like this. Mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> so you, you, you just did it again. The, uh, you just dovetailed to my next question. Uh, and it's in your own world, words, could you define permaculture and tell, uh, tell us what it means for the average Nashvilleian? Yeah, because it's a big <laughs> word. And it's yeah. a scary and daunting word, especially <laughs> when you start looking at everything that it involves. Mm-hmm. So I've learned to bring it down to a little bit fairly well. And Give it for to me, us. the way I explain it is uh, permaculture is a land management strategy to begin with. It's also a philosophy mm-hmm. and a way of viewing land management that's based in sustainability. Mm-hmm. And it has three core ethics, which are the priorities of your work. The first priority is earth care. Mm -hmm. You have a responsibility as stewards of the earth to care for the earth genuinely. Um, The second is um, people care. Mm -hmm. We care for the earth so that we can care for people. Like that is the goal. We Mm -hmm. want to take care of each other as humans. We want us all to thrive. Um, And then the third ethic is fair share, which is the idea of equity. Mm -hmm. you know, equitable distribution of resources and food and all the things so that everybody can live their healthy life to the best of their ability. Um, In that, uh, permaculture has a lot of like core practices, um, but basically they all come down to really being able to look at the system that you're working in. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, let's say you have uh, we have multiple different ecosystems that grow because it's 14 acres. Mm-hmm. So one of those systems is a wetland forest system down by the lake. Mm-hmm. Um, so spending time looking at that system and asking questions about, okay, what is working? Like, is the system functioning to its top capacity? What's working? What's not working? Uh, what plants were supposed to be here and are they here now? Mm-hmm. And if they're not, why are they gone? And, and what do we need to do to fix it? Um, what animals are supposed to be here? What animals are here? Because that tells you what plants you need to put here. Because right? yeah. you have to provide food. You know, when we talk about urban development and sustainability, we often forget about urban wildlife. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Davidson County alone is home to nine species of native bats. <laughs> and wow. So like there's, there's so much, I mean, at Grow, we have, we have everything from both red and silver foxes to deer, to wild turkeys, to uh, our state reptile, the um, Eastern box with Eastern box turtle. Um, okay. We have nesting um, <clears throat> kingfishers on the lake shore. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's like, it just this huge diversity of wildlife there and all yeah. that wildlife needs food and habitat too. And we can do that. We can create park spaces that do both. 
Um, so in that, it's like whole system management. Mm -hmm. And that was where Grow kind of made the leap, uh, where I, after a year or two of digging in and trying to understand, okay, you got to look at the whole system and then you make small changes. You don't get to, the whole first year we were there, I wasn't allowed to plant any, any trees. Okay. <laughs> Not by parks, but uh -huh. by my team. Gotcha. They're like, no, Ginger Rose, you can only, you have to spend, I had to spend a whole year charting how wind moves through the project site, how water washes over the project site, what yeah. kinds of creatures are there, like all the seasons, how the sun moves through it, doing the research, which is really hard for us humans because we want to fix the problem right now. Mm -hmm. We don't like that slow approach. And so, but that caused me to have to develop an intimate relationship with that 14 acres of parkland. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing because now I know a lot about the land and it helps yeah. me to make very informed decisions about what kinds of trees and plants and things should go there. Um, and in that, we kind of looked at that whole system management and there was a day, uh, and this is tied to my personal journey, um, I reached a point in my life as I hit my I approached 40 uh, that I was really unhealthy, physically unhealthy, really, really physically. Last year, I lost 70 pounds, actually. Congrats. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the way I did it uh, was that permaculture, permaculture changed my life um, mm -hmm. because I took that whole concept of like, look at this system. And what are the parts? What's functioning? What's not functioning? How can you improve it? What changes need to be made? And I applied mm -hmm. it to my own body system. Yeah. I was able to heal myself. And then I went, I picked my head up and I went, whoa, there's a whole community here. What, what is not working? The school yeah. system is broken. So many of our public service systems are broken. How yeah. do we fix all this? Like what small changes can we make? You know, and so that's where we really like kind of took permaculture from being just, it was intended as a land management strategy, but it's really a very functional model for community development. Yeah. Um, yeah kind of that, amazing. That is, that is amazing. <laughs> um, I just, I, you know, I, I wasn't too familiar with permaculture until, um, until just now, actually. Um, yeah. And it just, it, like, you know, it echoes like the same three tenets of sustainability, uh, but it kind of goes more into like system thinking. And I really mm -hmm. like that, yeah. I do too, because then you start to learn, like there are definitely things to pay attention to and, mm -hmm. and you can, and what's great about permaculture is that, you know, we can do it, we can do it on 14 acres, we could do permaculture land management on 300 acres, or we could shrink it down to a sixth of an acre in your backyard in East Nashville, you know, yeah. I mean, it can, it can be big or small because system, you know, ecosystems, you can, you're looking at the bigger ecosystem, but you also have little tiny micro ecosystems mm -hmm. in your small footprint. Yeah. And, and then of course we have all these public green spaces that are ecosystems just waiting to be healed and, yeah. you know, pushed to their maximum production. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I'm going to take a look at my backyard and so maybe apply some <laughs> permaculture principles to it in East Nashville. <laughs> you should start, I'm going to tell you, you should start by planting a cultivated pawpaw tree in your yard. Okay. Um, because the pawpaw is the only host plant for our state butterfly, the zebra swallowtail. Um, so you should plant one in your yard. Done. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so um, you got the, you all received that parcel of land from Metro Nashville Parks, uh, and it's in the Two Rivers Park system. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where your project site is. But within that project site, um, I saw that there are multiple different projects going on. Could you tell oh, yeah. us a little bit about those? Yeah. So there's a lot of different areas. Like I said, there's different ecosystems and each one has its different needs, but we are developing it out and it's mm -hmm. a long game um, because our goal is to really blend, you know, food forest with also the aesthetics uh, and the <laughs> green space. Still, it's still green space for the city. It still has to be a functional park space um with better you know more intention behind what's growing there um so yeah at the front entrance where the stones river greenway sweeps in front the public orchard is sitting right there which we call the silvo pasture that's a permaculture term and what silvo pasture is is a, it's a different way of growing an orchard typically orchards you plant the trees on a grid pretty mm -hmm. close together like if you've ever been to pick your own apple farm, they're mm -hmm. pretty close together. Yeah. In Silvo Pasture, they uh, they plant them in long straight rows, 
closer together than they should be um, for how big they're going to be. Mm -hmm. And with the intention of calling trees out at, on a progression as the main crop grows. So for us, uh, the main crop is the chestnut trees. Mm -hmm. Well, at maturity, that tree has a, a 50 foot crown, 50 foot diameter crown. It needs a lot of space. Um, but right now it's a little bitty tree. And mm -hmm. so um, in that we planted the first tree to be culled, which won't happen until the 15 or 20 year mark, which is gotcha. the uh, Northern red oak will be the first tree pulled out. Okay. And then the next one out from that in succession is the tree with the shortest lifespan, the American red plum. Mm -hmm. um, it will get called at 30 years, but it's peak, it's like, it's already in decline by the 25 year mark. It's a, it's a small tree, a fruit tree. Um, and then the third tree out is the native persimmon, which is a very tall, skinny tree, which might actually get to stay. Mm -hmm. But then you'll notice that there's like these big, wide, 50 foot alleyways in between those rows. Mm -hmm. That is done intentionally with the goal of eventually grazing animals in between the rows of trees. So then you gotcha. have the, the animal in the system that is providing the fertilizer, keeping the grass down, which benefits the trees, mm -hmm. all the things, right? You kind of cl it's closing the system. And that's a big part of permaculture too. And it's how permaculture really deeply digs into sustainability because, mm -hmm. you know, if we were, when we get to the point where it's fully self-sustainable, Nothing is nothing leaves the site, and even still, nothing leaves the site. Um, there have been some trees that we've had to take down for safety reasons, mm -hmm. and those trees were mulched and put right back into the forest system mm -hmm. right there. Um, like nothing leaves the property, mm -hmm. um, and we try to avoid bringing stuff in as much as possible. We want the system to be self sustaining. Yeah. Um, so the orchard is right there, so it has easy access to the students because the long term goal is to really have the students work directly with the trees, learn how to prune them, all the things, and, and participate. Uh, we're about two years away from our first crop up of chestnuts now, because okay. they're five years in the ground. This is the mm -hmm. fifth year in the ground, I think, or fourth year. Lost track. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that would be a thing. And then uh, as you go down the roadway, um, about the forest system that sits between the dog park and the lake, about mm -hmm. half of that forest system is under our care. Okay. Um, and we have gone through and reopened the hiking trail that used to be in there. There was a hiking trail that was cut through in the 70s when they put the lake in and it was in disrepair and all the bridges were broken and all the things. And so uh, we have some really outstanding community partners. I'll mention one for sure is Marriott Engineers. Mm -hmm. They have built multiple bridges for us down there and also helped us install the staircase that got put on the trail Okay. Um, so that the people can use it. And that area is really important to Donaldson and Nashville because it holds the natural springs that used to take the water to the Two Rivers Mansion. Okay. So there's a historical significance to what's down there in the spring system. Um, another thing we discovered in that system was a very old growth uh, grove of pawpaw trees, Asimina triloba trees, and mm -hmm. uh, had a little chat with the national expert on pawpaws, Neil Peterson, and he, when I told him how big they were, uh, and he goes, wait, what? And he pulls it up on a satellite and he goes, no, that can't be true. You're only 10 miles from First and Broadway. And yeah. like, there's no way you have trees that are 40, 50 foot tall down there. I was like, yes, we do. <laughs> um, That's so really cool. Kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, so we've taken a lot of time to clear invasive plants away from those trees. And so that's mm -hmm. kind of like a lot of volunteer work happens in that forest system. Um, it's pretty severely overrun with invasive non-native species. So a lot of our work there goes into that mm -hmm. and trying to keep the hiking trail open. And then as you move down the roadway, there's a barricade about halfway down where a small parking lot sits. Uh, to the left of that on the hillside, um, you know, we saw a need for the wildlife. You know, I told you that we have uh, box turtles, that, mm -hmm. you know, eastern box turtles there, but we also have pond sliders that come up onto that hillside to lay their eggs every year. Okay. And tall grass is really important for them important for the deer it's important for the foxes and mm -hmm. the predatory birds um, so we were able to negotiate cutting pathways but leaving a riparian zone basically along mm -hmm. that hillside 
And then as you move further back, you'll find our demonstration garden, which definitely needs some love right now. Um, <laughs> it's been hard with COVID yeah. trying to maintain the demonstration garden this year. Because usually our students, we have, a, we have an environmental science program that we offer for homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. And we typically do a summer camp program. So it usually falls to children to maintain the gardens for the children who have been there this year. Yeah. Um, and then above the gardens, inside the loop of the roadway is half of the nature playground. We installed mm -hmm. the third nature playground in the city, and it's the only one that's landscaped with edible landscaping, nice. um, which is really awesome. Yeah. And then above that, there's a small forest system that is like the forest half of the nature playground, and there's a small nature classroom up there and a trail that was built by children, actually. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. don't realize that kids built that trail. Um, they, they get get really excited about stuff like that and there's we we stock stuff up there for them to make forts and mm -hmm. various things uh, those are kind of the main areas there's some space mapped out for a future installation of an apiary um, mm -hmm. most of our bee work is focused on native pollinators mm -hmm. um, but honeybees are important too yeah. And so we do have in the master plan plans to install a large apiary to do educational work with. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, there's some other things coming down the pipeline. Sounds like an amazing space to <laughs> have out there at Two Rivers Park. Um, I am embarrassed that I haven't been yet, but I'm going to change that. <laughs> you should go out there definitely and you know uh, not everybody realizes you are allowed to kayak in that lake uh, oh. the lake the stipulations on the lake are no motorized vehicles there's no motorized vehicles behind the barrier period mm -hmm. um, but in the lake I see people out there with kayaks all the time and it's also has it has over 30 species of fish according to the fishermen um, people have been stocking that lake for decades yeah. and okay. they go out there and fish all the time and um, so definitely, if you have a kayak, take it with you. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Um, also, y'all have goats. We do have a herd of goats, and they're currently the goats. in my care. And they're not just any goats; they're mm -hmm. fainting goats, and they're really amazing. Which is that's a misnomer. They're <laughs> myotonic goats, but uh -huh. they're really important, especially in Tennessee, because that is a heritage breed for Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Um, but also because they're just amazing and they're really easy to take care of. Um, and they're super cute. They're super adorable. <laughs> and all yeah. three of our does are pregnant right now. So we'll have new baby goats in okay. the fall. So the, the herd is growing. The herd is growing. We have slowed the growth on the herd to make it okay. more manageable. Um, you know, ultimately the end game goal for having goats associated with our organization is to be able to use them to help manage the invasive non-native species in the mm -hmm. forest. Mm -hmm. um, just so we can try to save as much of that forest system as possible. Um, and then also to, to deal with the grass out in the orchard and the yeah. open areas during the warm season, but we're just not quite there yet. I think we, we're, we definitely uh, need to put a little bit more like structure in place before we'll be ready but we're getting there in the meantime i kind of love them mm -hmm. <laughs> they they came to us by gift from trebecca university uh, okay. from the urban farm so all okay. the goats that we have in our herd were born at trebecca um except for the, the ones that were part of offspring mm -hmm. with us. but um they're really amazing <laughs> I love, love, them goats. So much. love goats love 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 and um also uh feel free to check out grow enrichment's website where they have pictures and profiles of each goat in the herd <laughs> <laughs> i thought i deactivated that actually <laughs> it's still the goats up. are on hiatus right now they're on like pandemic hiatus at a mm -hmm. farm here in sparta and they're like living their best life out there in the hillside with 22 acres to graze and they're yeah. just on vacation right now Perfect. They they deserve nothing less. I mean, they worked <laughs> hard last year. They they went to quite a few events. The babies went to the Deep Tropics Festival. Yeah, yeah. The Earth Day Festival, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think even to the Urban Gardening Festival. Like they were all over town last year, so they deserve some some quality rest time. Living living that celebrity life kind of really <laughs> takes that out of you, I would imagine. It is, it, it's hard to be a famous goat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Anytime um, you want me to bring one by your office, you just let me know. I don't know what you're. I don't know if you know what you're signing up for by making that offer. I mean, 
they fit really nicely in the back of my Prius. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> they're smaller, right? They're so little. Yeah. One of the ones that uh, came from the kidding, um, Milo, is full grown now, and he's not more than 35 pounds. He's tiny. Yeah. So little. I feel like we could gush for goats a little, well, just for the rest of this interview. But um. I mean, we could. <laughs> Yeah. And that's what, you know, it circles back to also, you know, we can do the, the plant management side of permaculture all day long mm -hmm. and, but we're not ever going to make as much progress as fast as we will if we introduce the animal. Like that's the, it's again, like, and we work with the wildlife there, the wildlife plays a role. Mm -hmm. um, and by us intentionally saving habitat for wildlife, that helps. But having an animal that can come in like a goat that can really like knock out invasive plants or something like that is really beneficial. Yeah. Um, my family and I have also spent a year uh, raising Indian runner ducks because they can be used for okay. pest management. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a herding instinct just like goats. So you can move them through a system um, the same way. So, okay. So maybe at some point you'll see some runner ducks out there too. Yeah, I'm looking for the duck profiles now. <laughs> <laughs> We're keeping the ducks on the DL. All right, <laughs> ducks are on the DL. My lips are sealed. Mom's the word. <laughs> it's about to be public knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got one more question for you. Um, what is your sustainable sustainable vision for the city of Nashville? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's what we're doing right now. You know, mm -hmm. we've been watching you guys. Uh, Y'all were at your five-year mark, the year that we were founded. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that I think is really special about the nonprofit sector in Nashville is that we take a collaborative approach instead of the, like, oh, you're competing with me for that grant. Because yeah. I think that that's dysfunctional. Yeah. Um, so more of this mm -hmm. we're building bridges and we're working collaboratively because really the strength the strength that, for, that we need to be able to make real progress quickly mm -hmm. will come from us teaming up in each organization doing what they do best and letting the other organization do what they do best and yeah. we all work together. Um, I think that that's really important. Um, in terms of sustainability, you know, Nashville, Nashville's treasure, in my opinion, really is the park system. Mm -hmm. I mean, I tell that to people who come, you know, friends who come from Texas and want to know what's cool in Nashville. I always say, well, the park system is cool in Nashville. Like, yeah. our parks department does an amazing job of holding land and trust for us. Yeah. Um, and we are so blessed to have so many green spaces, but we also could work together with the community to help expand, you know, the care of it, like invasive plants are a huge problem, mm -hmm. um, you know, and everyone's concerned about planting trees in Nashville as we should be, but we should also be concerned about saving trees in Nashville. And mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've driven through Belmede and Green Hills and all over the place and seen some of our biggest, oldest canopy trees covered in invasive plants that are literally strangling them. Mm -hmm. um, so getting in touch with the people who run the weed wrangle, and the Tennessee Invasive Plant Council, like that's a thing. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be managing invasive plants in their backyard. Yeah. And, um, you know, sustainability, I would like to see us, you know, grow, grow what grow sees long term is us, you know, using the Two River site. At, it's, a, it's a prototype. Mm -hmm. It really is it's a prototype. It's a chance for us to play, figure out what works, create the model, and then go, okay. How do we reapply this to every other park in the city and then move to the state and then move out? Like that's the goal. Like yeah. everywhere there's green space, there's potential. But there's no reason that we should ever plant another boxwood bush anywhere in the city. Mm -hmm. They do nothing for us and they're prone to disease. And you know, we have things like blueberry bushes that are beautiful and they're native. They're native to this area and they thrive here and they make food. I was going to say, and they make blueberries. Yeah. So like it's those little changes, you know, one of our mm -hmm. partners, uh, Jeremy Luckich at Nashville Foodscapes, mm -hmm. his whole business is built around that. And it's yeah. genius. It's genius. You know, just helping people understand or like think and be conscious about what you're planting and cultivating in your yard and in the landscaping industry and what you're buying. Because, you know, what people buy is what nurseries will produce. Yeah. 
you know, so stop buying you on as a ground cover. Yeah. You know, um, those kinds of things could go a long way. And these conversations help that a lot. A yeah. lot of it's just awareness. Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, that was a lovely, lovely sustainable vision for Nashville. Um, and I'm, I really appreciate the work that you're doing that contributes to it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. You too. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate you guys. We really, really <clears throat> admire the way uh, Urban Green Lab has stepped up to, to fill some of the gaps in environmental education in the school system, because that's mm -hmm. something that we're very passionate about too. And yeah. uh, at the time that the need came, you guys were able to take that and say, yes, we can run with that ball. And we were not there yet. And so I'm, I always am so thankful to your organization for you guys taking the lead on that piece of the pie because mm -hmm. it freed us up to do what yeah. we do. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's all about those nonprofits working in tandem, putting the information out there, raising awareness and um, creating that positive social change. Yeah. 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 All together. <laughs> 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 well, Ginger, sweet, uh, Ginger Rose, thank you so much for joining me here today. Um, if viewers have any additional questions or want to get involved, what's the uh, best way to reach you? I think reaching us directly through the website is your best bet. Um, those emails come directly to me okay. um, at growenrichment.org. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can also reach out through Facebook. Uh, there's about three or four of us on the team who, who watch for messages coming through the Facebook page mm -hmm. as well. Um, it's grow enrichment there too. Um, okay. And I'll provide those links as well. So yeah, people can go you. right to you. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining me here today, Ginger Rose. Um, next week, we'll be interviewing Jennifer Westerholm of Socket, Metro Nashville Sustainability Outlet. Uh, if you have any questions for Jennifer or you want to make a recommendation on an organization that you would like to learn more about, feel free to email me. Um, my email address is patrick at urbangreenlab.org. Uh, and until the next time, remember to live sustainably. Mm -hmm.